I, like Mark last week, am teaching through a book of the Bible to our peculiar people class. We're going through Revelation. So today we're looking at Revelation 3, a dying church. Now please note, I don't think our church is dying. I think we're alive and well. And if I were to preach next week, I would be preaching on uh, the Philadelphian church, the missionary church. So blame Dan Duncan if you don't like today. That being said, this is what the Spirit has for us. So please turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3, we'll look at verses 1 through 6. That's the word of the Lord. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it, and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy." He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and our time this morning. Shall we pray? Well, if you've been through a study of Revelation... You know there's seven letters at the beginnings of the book, and ultimately what you will have is five different parts of every letter, and they're essentially the same. It starts off with, with a description of Jesus Christ describing himself and describing himself in a unique way with each individual church. And next you'll have a commendation, that is what the church is doing right. Then you have the rebuke, what the church is doing wrong. Fourthly, you'll have an exhortation where Jesus tells them what to do right or else. Sometimes he has to have the warning or else in there. And then finally, number five is a promise. If you will overcome, you will receive this. And I'm of the opinion that the overcomer is the true believer in Christ. We are more than conquerors. We are overcomers by God's grace. Let me tell you a little bit about the city of Sardis, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the church. And there we're going to dig right into the text. The city of Sardis is 33 miles southeast of Thyatira, which may mean nothing to you unless you've been studying the churches with us so long. But you should know this. It's one of on several highways in modern-day Turkey. Um, It is an abandoned city now. It's a ghost town. But at that time, it was a rich city. It had a theater, stadium, temples, Beautiful marble road that went through the city itself. It was built upon a hill. As a matter of fact, it wasn't just a hill. It was seen as sort of an impregnable hill. It was 1,500 feet high from the road. Three sides of it were sheer cliffs. And even as I said, it was impregnable, but it was conquered. Cyrus the Persian in 549 B.C., he attacked it for two weeks, but couldn't come up with anything. Couldn't get in. Finally, he pulled his men together and he says, whoever can find the way to overcome the city, some sort of secret passageway, tell me, I'll make you rich. Well, one day, a soldier named uh, Hierates noted a Sardis soldier lose his helmet. And his helmet fell down the hill and it rolled down the cliff into kind of a passageway, if you will, that wasn't seen by the opposing army. Hierates uh, then went straight to Cyrus. Cyrus was able to sneak his Persian army all the way to the top, and they just walked right in without a fight. And yet Cyrus would have never captured the city of Sardis if they had just put out a guard to watch. That's all they needed to do. You know what's even more fascinating about the story? Is 300 years later, the Greeks did the same thing to the Persians. They found that one secret passageway, made their way up, and conquered without a fight. You see, Sardis, folks, was never defeated by a frontal attack, only by the enemy sneaking in. That's all it was. 
Let me tell you a little bit about this church, because you will see that the church reflects the city. But before I do, I should quote Dr. Johnson on this at a great point. He said, The Sardis Church was the perfect model of inoffensive Christianity, which had come to terms completely with the pagan environment in which it existed. Uh, you know, we ought to ask ourselves, is Believer's Chapel an example of inoffensive Christianity? Is it an example of a young, or rather, is it an example of a group of people who profess the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but nevertheless have come to terms with a pagan environment around us? And make no mistake about it, the environment around us is a pagan environment. And obviously this was said a good 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Well, the church itself was founded by the saints. We don't know exactly who, but perhaps some saints who had heard Paul give the gospel in Ephesus. Ephesus is not too far away from this city. And yet the church is dying. It's dying. And what's interesting about it is you'll see this in our study. It had no outside agitators. Uh, the church of Pergamum, the church of Thyatira, these other churches, they had persecution coming from the Jews that were not believers, having persecution regarding emperor worship, trying to force Christians to worship the emperor. There's nothing in that here. Although they did have pagan religion, it didn't seem like they had enemies, these Christians. Uh, secondly, you will see they had no inside enemies in the sense that there was no false teaching going on in the church as it was in the other churches. There was no Jezebel as it was in Thyatira, this prophetess that was teaching bad theology. No, that's what's very scary about this church. No outside, no inside enemies. And I will tell you, it is the first of the seven churches with no commendation. Nothing. Nothing. As a matter of fact, we'll see the commendation is actually a rebuke. So let's go ahead and dig in, shall we? Chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. Let me stop there. Uh, you see this in Revelation 1. Is uh, Jesus Christ in his glorified state. He's holding things in his hands. One of them are the seven spirits of God. We take this to mean the Holy Spirit, and that is, the point is, the Son of God has the fullness of the Spirit in Him, and He can give it to whomever He will, right? And He gave it to us by His grace, right? He died for us. He sent His, His Spirit to live within us. We also see not just the seven spirits of God, and seven being the number of completion, so the fullness of the Spirit He's holding, but also the seven stars, and we'll see the seven stars are a picture of the seven churches that he's writing to in Revelation. Uh, the seven stars in particular, though, are the messengers or angels of each of these churches. And the point, I think, of the text is that he's got the Spirit in his hand. He also has the seven churches and the seven messengers, or the, if you will, the angels. He's got the whole world in his hands, to quote that phrase. And the point is, is that he can give new life to this church. But will he? I don't know. Continuing on in verse 2, uh, rather verse 1, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. There's the commendation. You have a reputation of being alive, but it's sort of a backhanded compliment, right? Because all they have is a reputation. But when you look closer, you will see that your works are dead. Dead. Question. How does the scriptures use the metaphorical word dead? In reading the different commentaries on this sort of um, passage, many people would kind of launch off into the deeds. But I want to look at what does the Bible says about the word dead? Because it's very clear he's, he's speaking here. He's saying you have, the re you have the sort of reputation of deeds, but they're dead. What does it mean? Well... Uh, dead is re regarding James to a person without faith, right? Faith without works is dead. Your works don't save you, but when you are a true believer, you will produce works. You know, it just happens. We're not going to qualify because the scriptures don't qualify how much, but you have the Spirit of God living within you. You're going to produce works. It will happen at some time or another. I don't think it's referring to this right here because I don't think the Sardis church is, is dead. I think it's dying. Even though he used the word dead here, he'll qualify that in just a moment. 
Uh, I think it's referring to the second definition of dead, and that means a person who is spiritually asleep. You see in Ephesians 5.14, referring to believers, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Romans 13.11 has the same idea. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. What's the problem with the Sardis church? I think we're talking about believers that have been coasting for years. They go through the motions. They go to church on Sundays. They may be involved in Bible study. They, they seem to know the Word of God, and yet they're coasting through life. They're not running. They're not pursuing. They're not prayerful. They're not seeking to win people to Christ. They've got their justification taken care of. They're fine. And I think of 2 Timothy 3.5 where it says, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. I mean, folks, have we forgotten the early Christians? What were they known for? By the enemies. They've turned the world upside down. Right? What would the world say about us? I think we have to ask that. Which, whichever congregation you're a part of, what would the world say? Are we turning the world upside down? Well, before we go there, how, how were they dead? And this is interesting because the text doesn't actually tell us how they were dead. I mean, you could read through the whole thing and you go, I don't know exactly in what areas they were dead in, in what areas they were not completing their works. But you know, I figure the ancients are a lot like us because what I've found is when you read through different believers throughout the centuries, you know what we'll, fi we'll find that they're so weak in? They're not so good in the great commandment right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Part of that would be pr the prayer life of saints. It's always, it's always a struggle. But secondly, in the area of the Great Commission, making disciples of all nations. You know, it's interesting. If you were to die today, uh, like right here in this auditorium, and I hope that happens to none of, of us, unless you, well, you get, get to go home to glory, so it's not so bad. But I guarantee you, I would listen to the last things that you said. It's very important, right? You know that just by example. You see this in life. What were the last words Jesus said? Well, we could go through the different texts of the Gospels, and we would see. I'll just give them to you, at least some of them. Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all creation. Luke 24, 47 and 48, repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning with Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Acts 1, 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Are you catching a theme? Yeah, I think so. I think so, and um, we don't know exactly what areas they were weak on, terribly weak, but I would say a pretty good guess would be the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, right? And if we're honest, if I'm honest, these are weaknesses of mine as well. Verse 2, wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Here we're going to see Jesus is going to give them a five-fold exhortation, all right? He's already given them the rebuke. Your deeds are dead. They're not completed, as we'll see. Exactly what that means, we're, we're just, it's, it's just a good guesstimation. But first off, he will tell them, wake up, or as some of the translators put it, be watching. And it's what's fascinating, y'all, is this where the city failed, right? The city failed to keep watch. And the enemy crept in and took away their witness and took away their city. But the Bible says regarding waking up or keeping watchful is used in two ways. Number one, Jesus uses it in his return, right? Matthew 24, 42, stay awake for you don't know the day your Lord is coming. I don't think that's what the text is referring to. I think it's referring to the second. And that is be spiritually alert. He also says this in the garden. Watch and pray. Stay awake so you don't fall into temptation. 
You see, this is the reason why Sardis was destroyed. Not once, but twice. Because she didn't guard her city. She wasn't awake. Right? Uh, I've mentioned this before, but I think the Sardis church was underwhelmed with Christ. I think she's underwhelmed with him. I mean, remember when you first became a believer? Kind of go back in time with me. When you first, when God first saved you, you remember thinking this? You're going, I need to talk to my friends about Christ. People are going to hell out there. Ah, man, I need, passionate about the word, passionate about prayer. And what happened with time? We're like a really bad balloon. We just kind of leak, right? We come back down to earth. And what happened is we just go from overwhelmed to being underwhelmed. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Yet, if I'm honest, I primarily live for myself. Listen, no one would say that at Believer's Chapel. But how many of us are really feeling it? How do you know you're living for yourself? I don't know. Check out your credit card statement. Look at the time you spend. Check it out. Wake up, is what he's saying. Second thing, verse 2, and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. The reason why I think the people of Sardis were believers is because he's saying there's, there's something here to strengthen, all right? If you're an unbeliever, you have nothing to strengthen. You're a dead man walking. As a believer, there is something to strengthen. He's talking about their works here. They, hey, these things are about to die. Uh, our souls... Ladies and gentlemen, even as believers, we can grow cold. We can grow cooler to the things of the gospel, the things of God. And the idea is, as Paul tells Timothy, fan the flame. All right? Fan the flame. We'll talk about that. He says, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Going back to the city of Sardis, let's take a look at this. Uh, they had something called the Artemis Temple. It was huge. The Artemis Temple in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the world. The Artemis temple at Sardis was just as big, but it had never been completed. As a matter of fact, it never was completed. It's interesting Jesus uses this same term. As believers, the Sardis folks, they started strong. They got secure in Christ, which they should. And what happened next? Instead of running, they started walking. They got comfortable. Running is hard. I just prefer to walk, right? Think about this. What does the Lord think of us here at Believer's Chapel? Do we have it, do we have it all together? Are our works completed? Well, our doors are open every Sunday morning, every Sunday evening. We gather on Wednesday nights. We have deeds. Do they please God? What does He see in our hearts? If it's just routine, it's deadly. By the way, I just quoted Dan Duncan. It's always nice to use convicting words of others, right? People can't blame me for that one. What does it mean to be completed? Well, I think what it means to be completed, it's lacking something. It's lacking something. It may be, we don't know exactly what it was, and I'm glad the text doesn't tell us, because for it, that way it can apply to every congregation who's ever studied this. What's it lacking for our church? I don't know. But for their church, we're not exactly certain either. It could be lack of love. It could be, I'm certain it was lack of passion as well. I think they lost their aggression for the gospel. I think they lost their love for the kingdom of God. Uh, Warren Wearsby says this. He says, the impression is that the Sardis church was not aggressive in its witness for this, to the city. There was no persecution because there was no invasion of Satan's territory. The unsaved in Sardis simply saw the church as a respectable group of people who were neither dangerous nor desirable. They were decent people with a dying witness and a decaying ministry. Let me tell you what, regarding the American church, uh, one of my professors at uh, a PhD program, he quoted a study that said only 31% of believers share, their share the gospel on a regular basis, 31%. You know what regular is, according to the study? Regular was defined as one time every six months. 31%, one time every six months. 
That's scary. That's scary because I've I mentioned before, there's reasons why at baptism, the, they just don't hold you down and send you on to glory. As Tommy Nelson used to say, you get back up, go make disciples, go practice the great commandment. That's one of the best things you can do for an unbeliever, right? Give him the gospel if you love him. Uh, there's a story about, uh, I may have shared this one other time, a story about a guy named Penn Jillette. He's a famous entertainer. He's, he's a magician and he's an atheist. He actually became an atheist back in high school when he was going to an evangelical church. He's walked away. Obviously, we know God will save him. He will save. It's not up to us to do this, but it is us, up to us to witness. Well, he's an atheist. He's pretty well known. Uh, he tells a story about a man who came to him one of, after one of his magic shows. The man came up to talk to him. Uh, Penn Gillette describes him as polite, kind, and seemed to genuinely care for me. He said, this man gave me a Bible. He looked me in the eyes and said, I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of proselytizing. I'm a businessman. I'm sane. I'm not crazy. And Penn Gillette was just kind of encouraged by this. And Penn will use the term proselytize uh, as a synonym for evangelize. Same thing. And listen to what he has to say about the gospel, even though Penn Gillette does not believe the gospel. Listen to what he says. I've always said, I don't respect people who don't proselytize or evangelize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there is a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? If I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that this truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. That's words from an atheist. Thomas Watson put it like this. He was a Puritan, one of my favorites, who wrote uh, one of his books called Heaven Taken by Storm. And he quotes... Matthew eleven twelve, 12, where Jesus says, The kingdom of God suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. Some commentators uh, see this as a negative thing uh, when it says that violent men take it by force. Thomas Watson and, and me and several others take it as a very positive thing that Jesus is saying here. You could take it either way. But he takes this, uh, Thomas takes this as meaning believers need to be violent. And what he means by violent is uh, aggressive, loving action in life, right? As we pursue unbelievers for Christ, as we read the word, as we pray, we ought to be violent for the kingdom of God. He writes this, uh, when we lose that aggression, we lose our witness. It is a holy violence. Our work is great. Our time is short. Our master is urgent. Many have made themselves drunk with the pleasures of this world. And yet a drunken man is unfit to run a race. And yet how violent Christ was about our salvation. So question, do you do violence for the kingdom of God? Well, what does your prayer life look like? Oh, now I'm meddling, I know. He writes this, prayer without fervency, prayer without violence is not prayer. It's speaking, not praying. Lifeless prayer is no more prayer than a picture of a man is a man. I was getting all sorts of trash talk yesterday morning from a bunch of Oklahoma Sooners. Some of you are laughing because you got to see the results yesterday. Um, I'm not a huge Texas Longhorns fan, but anytime they play Oklahoma, I become violent for the Texas Longhorns. You know what I speak of. You become violent for different things, don't you? It may not be college football. It might be the Dallas Cowboys. It might be your business. It might be even your family, even good things. But are you violent for Jesus Christ, right? And that's what he's telling them. Strengthen what remains. Complete it. Complete that. Number th three, verse three. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent I will come like a, or I will come like a thief in the night. You will not know at what hour I will come to you. 
We see the last three imperatives right here. Remember what you have received and heard. This probably refers to the teaching they had heard about Jesus Christ. And what was that teaching? Remember, you're saved by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. Nothing of yourselves, all right? Come to Christ. I'm sure that was part of the teaching. But then once they had become believers in Jesus Christ, what was the other teaching? Walk in his steps. First Peter, right? Walk in his steps. He's our supreme example. And you may be thinking, uh, Jeff, I hear what you're saying, but let me just be honest in my mind. I don't, I don't really love people like I should. I don't want to witness as I should. I don't want to pray. Um, I'm here to tell you today there's hope when you say those things. You know why? Because Christ didn't want to go to the cross either. Now, your desires are sinful. His was not. He didn't want to be separated from his father. But what did he do? He went. Why did he go? Why did he do that, even though he didn't want to? What's it say in Hebrews? For the joy set before him. He went to the cross, despising the shame, right? So you may not want to do these things, but the sweet thing about it is you've got an engine inside of you called the Holy Spirit, and he wants you to do these things. So it's not a matter of you trying to work it up. It's just a matter of allowing Spirit to work in your life, yielding to him, right? Uh, fourth thing is to keep it. He says, I want you to keep it. Not only remember what you've received and heard, but keep it. John 13 is this concept is uh, Jesus says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are you if you do them. So first off, remember. Uh, rather, third, thirdly, is remember. Um, by the way, one of the best things we can do as believers is remember. What are we remembering? Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. We do that on Sunday evenings. Just do a personal invite. If you never come on Sunday evenings, please come out. It's an opportunity to take the Lord's Supper, an opportunity to be with the saints. Um, we're supposed to remember. It's vitally important for a believer to remember what a big sinner you are. Wicked, filthy, right? And then what a great Savior you have, right? So remember, the next thing he says, keep it, mean, meaning obey it. When Jesus washes his, the feet of the apostles, he's saying, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. He will even say in John 13, I'm your example. He goes that far and says, I've set the example for you. So, so do this, right? And the fifth imperative we'll see is repent. And this is vitally important. Repent is the Greek word metanoia. Most folks would define it as a change of mind that results in a change of action. It is a gift of God. It's the other side of the coin of the gift of faith, if you will. Uh, John the Baptist will say, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Uh, so if you are really repentant, but there's no fruit coming forth, what do you call that? You call it remorse, right? You're sad because you got your hand caught in the cookie jar. You're not sad because you disobeyed your parents. Right? So that's this concept here, metanoia. It's, it's a gift of God. Uh, it's a change of mind that results in a change of action. Here's the thing. It happens as justification. You may not fully grasp all these concepts, but as, like I said, it's a gift. Uh, the idea is you left sin as your master and you followed a different master doesn't mean you, you dropped all sins, right? Because you are still a sinner, even as a believer. But you're no longer following sin as your master. You're following Jesus as your master. So it happens at justification. You know when else it happens? It happens, at sanctific it happens during sanctification, your whole life. Uh, and you may be wondering, well, what are, what are they told to repent of? I think they're repenting of their indifference to Jesus Christ, their indifference to the kingdom of God along with a lot of other things that we don't know about. Uh, repentance, though, should be a way of life for believers. Some people are of the opinion, that, no, 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 I repented at justification. I don't do that throughout my whole life. God knows what a sinner I am. Y'all, that doesn't line up with Scripture. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a present tense. Um, to quote Dan one more time, he compared repentance, and I think he did it, I think he nailed it, he compared repentance to when Lot and his family are called to leave Sodom. And what's their one command they're supposed to not do? Don't turn back. 
Don't turn back, right? And Dan had said, turning away from and not looking back, that's repentance. And yet we do look back, right? As believers, we continue to sin. That's why I think repentance is a daily, constant process that we go through. We are continually to be repenting of the things that we do. Uh, as one of the uh, theologians has said, even my best sins or rather, even my best acts are nothing more than splendid sins, because we are sinners. Now, here's the warning. Therefore, if you do not wake up, it says in verse 3, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I come to you. The same way Christ describes his return in Matthew 24, but here he's not referring to his return. And you may say, well, Jeff, it says I will come like a thief. I mean, it's there. Well, Sometimes the phrase means his return, but sometimes it means him coming for judgment. And by the way, the reason why I can prove that it's not referring to his return upon the earth is because he says, if you do not wake up. Y'all, Christ is going to return no matter what happens here, right? Or what happens with the people of Sardis. That's his prerogative. That's the Father is going to make that call. So he's saying, if you do not wake up. You see, that it's a proverb here. Uh, when you say something coming like a thief in the night, it's, very, it's a very common proverb among the ancients. The Greeks, the Romans would know this. It's a proverb for unexpectedness. Remember, the city of Sardis would know exactly what it would mean to come like a thief in the night. It happened to them twice in their history, at least. So I think it's referring to some sort of discipline this church would receive. Uh, doesn't Christ discipline those whom he loves? Yep. 1 Corinthians 11, it says that's why some of you are sick and some of you have even died. The discipline of the Lord. So it could be sickness, could be death. It could be even taking away their lampstand, saying, let's just shut down this body. Let's, let's move the spirit to another place. These people are, we need to shut this one down. This is what he, he threatened to do with Ephesus. Verse 4, here's some good news. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Back in the ancient days, if you were to wear dirty clothes uh, to the pagan temple, you wouldn't be allowed to enter, right? It just wouldn't happen. You couldn't do it. Here we have some in the church have not messed up their garments, soiled their garments. I get the idea that some in the church were really being aggressive, aggressive in their love to towards the Lord, toward the lost, towards their fellow believer. They were being passionate in prayer. They weren't just doing Christianity. It's kind of a rote exercise of life. I do this on Sundays. This is what I do, right? What happens? This is they will walk with me in white. The white is always a picture of a couple of things. Number one is victory, and it could be a picture of this because we are victorious in Christ. Or I think it's probably a picture of Christ's imputed righteousness, it says, for they are worthy. They walk in white because they're worthy. We're worthy only because of what Christ did for us. That's why one day we will receive garments of white. Verse 5, he who overcomes, and I think this is once again the true believer, will thus be clothed in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Let's talk about this. First off, white garments we've talked about. It says, I will not erase or blot out his name from the book of life. Book of life. This has given many believers, oh, hours upon reflection. Like, what is this book of life? Uh, some th people think it just started in talking about this in Revelation. Oh, no, contraire. Actually, no. In Matthew 10, 20, Jesus tells his disciples, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Of course, in Revelation 13, 17, and 20, it talks about the book of life. In particular, in chapter 20, it's talking about the great white throne judgment where the books will be open, and one of them is the book of life. Uh, and we also see in Exodus, even as far back as Exodus, remember the people have worshipped the calf, and Moses has prayed for them. And Moses will say, blot my name out from the book. And I mean, he's basically saying, he's in intercessory prayer for these people, saying, take me out and not these people. And what does God say to him in Exodus? The Lord said, whoever sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. 
He ain't lying. He's speaking the truth. I'm going to. In Psalm 69, when it's referring to the enemies of God, the psalmist can say by inspiration of the Spirit, let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. Question. Are certain names blotted out or erased from the book of life? I think so. Let me explain. Uh, ancient cities, and this would be Sardis included, would always keep a register, uh, we, or we would call it a roll. Uh, for the people in here that were born in the 70s or back, we used to have something called white pages. Do we still have white pages? I don't even know if we do anymore. Um, but now everything's on the phone or our computer. But uh, it has a, every person's name there. Now, interesting thing, in the ancient days, if you were to commit some heinous crimes, you'd be removed. They would just take you out of the book. They would blot your name out. Well, perhaps, and this is a perhaps, in the Lamb's Book of Life, it has a person's name. Perhaps every person's name who's ever lived. And yet, once you die, if you have never come to Christ, and that is the only crime that is worthy of death, eternal death, your name will be blotted out from the book. It's just a guess. Uh, but obviously God is clear in Exodus, I will blot out their name from the book. So there's something that he's blotting out. And so by the time you get to the great white throne judgment, only believers' names are found in the book. Why? Well, you know why. It's called the book of life. Believers are the only ones who have life, Right? Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You didn't know he was talking about a book, did you? I think he was. By the way, let me give you two Greek words for those people at this moment are starting to shake in your boots, and you've got this incessant fear that you're not really a believer, and you really are a believer. Some of us really need to be shaking because we're not real believers. We're not true believers. We're really trusting in our own good works. But no, some of you in here have got a desperate fear that you are actually not a believer, and you've struggled with this for years. And all I'm telling you, there are believers that struggle with this. William Cooper, one of them. Even Luther struggled with this. I'm going to give you two words that you will find hopefully encouraging, and that is two little Greek words called ou me. Ou me. It is the strongest way in the Greek language to say, no, never. So the way it could read in verse 5, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not never erase his name from the book of life. But that would be poor grammar. But that's what it means. Uh, remember, keep in mind, if, you're, if this sort of talk makes you nervous, you didn't purchase your salvation. If you purchase your salvation, you can lose it. You didn't purchase it. Somebody else purchased it. It says in John 6, 37, All the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And some have said before, well, it says Jesus will never cast me out, but maybe I can cast myself out. Oh, so you're more powerful than God. Is that what you're trying to say? Because you don't want to go down that road. No, banish those thoughts. The Lord has saved you if you are in Christ. Jesus goes further and he says in Matthew, Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father in heaven. Uh, at this point, some people would say, deny? Well, man, I've denied him by my actions. I mean, there's times I should have witnessed. I mean, millions of times and I haven't done it. Well, no, I don't think this means deny once. Because remember, Peter denied him three times. It's this idea that your life looks like one long denial of the Lord. Your co-workers, your neighbors, no one knows that you're a believer. Uh, you take opportunity to deny him. And perhaps you deny him by your words or maybe by your silence. This is not what it's referring to. Uh, uh, rather, Jesus is saying, hey... You don't deny me, I don't deny you. It's not the idea of quid pro quo, you give, I give. It's the idea that you show by your, by your works that you're a, you're a believer, right? You're saved by grace through faith alone, and he'll go as far as to say, I'm not going to deny you. It's the idea of, in my position, if he were to say, I'm not going to deny you before the Father, Jeff Brown. You're mine. As a matter of fact, 
bring Jeff Brown right here in front of the Father and before the angels. This one's mine. Yes, he's a mess. He's mine. I bought him. The Father, he, he elected him. I paid for him. The Son, rather, the Spirit was given to him. He's mine. And if you are in Christ as well, you should note this. One of these days, and I don't know how it's going to look, and he's doing it even now as he, as he defends you before the Father, is that he owns you, right? He owns you. He makes it clear before the Father, I'm not going to deny you. You're mine. Verse 6, uh, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus uses these same words, right? And here it cuts across the centuries to Dallas, Texas. Those who are in the room here today, he who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hear. Whatever became of the church of Sardis? Well, I've, I think I've got some good news. In the second century, uh, we have an, uh, a writing from Bishop Melito, and he says the church of Sardis, they're walking with Christ. He has good things to say about the leadership of the church. I told you, today Sardis is a ghost town, yet there are ruins of a fourth century Byzantine church, revealing, I think, that this church did repent of her deadness, of her dead works. As a believer or as an unbeliever, let me give you some counsel as we close up. Um, I was a tennis coach uh, at one time, and I learned tennis from my dad. And he taught me, he would always say when we would have a, I don't know, I would have a bad time playing. I just wasn't playing that well. He would always say, son, go back to the basics. And I would tell the tennis players the same thing. Whenever they would have a bad match, go back to the basics. And what are the basics in tennis? Well, it's probably very similar to other sports. Uh, but one is your footwork. Your footwork. Are you where you need to, where you should be in order to hit the ball? Your feet should be placed, right? Uh, you should be running. Nothing made my dad more angry or made me more angry as a coach as a tennis player that wouldn't run on the court. He's supposed to run. That's, that's kind of the sport, right? Secondly, how about the racket? The racket should be like part of your body. Uh, the racket is, hey, how you grip it, eastern, western, continental grip. If you hold it open face, you're going to hit it further. If you hit it closed face, you could go right into the net. And so you teach them how to hold the racket accurately, right? And then finally, the most important thing, I bet you know what it is. Fix your eyes on the ball, right? Fix your eyes on the ball. You can't even play if you're not getting there, right? With a racket, with your eyes on the ball. And by the way, if you're, if you're not doing those things, then just repent. Or in the tennis logo, change. Okay? Just change. As a believer, I'm telling you today, what is your footwork? Well, are you running the race? The Bible says to run. So many of us, included me, we've gotten used to just walking. We went from running to kind of skipping to kind of walking. Y'all have got work to do, according to Ephesians 2.10. Right? Great commission, making disciples. Great commandment, loving, right? You've got work set before you that you just walk in them. But you're supposed to be running. That's the picture. Your footwork. Watch your footwork. By the way, some of us are not even where you're supposed to be on the court of life. So get there. Change. Repent. How about the racket? Well, it's the racket of life is your word. Are you handling it accurately? Are you holding it tightly like you would hold a racket? Are you holding the promises of God? Do you really believe, Romans 8, 28, there's a bunch of bunk, that all things really are working together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, right? That God is not done with the work in you. He's going to complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. And finally, how about this? Are you fixing your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of your faith? That's what you should be doing dropping off everything, right, that hinders the sin that so easily entangles, let us run with endurance the race set before us. If you're a believer today, back to the basics. You're clothed in white because of Christ's righteousness, right? You've got your tennis duds on. You look great because of Christ. Now go do the work. If you're an unbeliever today, I've got bad news for you. Some of you today, perhaps you are 
you think you're on the team uh, because your parents are believers or maybe because you go to church sometimes. Uh, but ultimately, one day you're going to reach the heavenly court and you're going to realize the one you thought was your coach is really the umpire. Right? He's not on your side. You never were on his side. He's going to look down and say, I never knew you. Depart from me into the fires of hell. Prepare for the Satan and his angels. You see, the problem, if you were to look down at that point, you would see something. You're not wearing white garments. The only white garments that you could ever earn, you didn't earn. Because you won't earn them anyway. Jesus Christ gave them to you, right? And you don't have white garments. What do you do? Calvin will finish. He quotes, They shall walk in black, for they are unworthy. They shall walk in black, the blackness of God's destruction. They shall walk in black, the blackness of hopeless despair. They shall walk in black, the blackness of incomparable anguish. They shall walk in black, the blackness of damnation. They shall walk in black forever because they were found unworthy. Ladies and gentlemen, your worthiness is in Jesus Christ alone. Flee to the cross. Father, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you that we are not worthy apart from Jesus Christ. We pray for anybody in here that does not yet know the Son. Would you grant them the grace to believe? And we thank you in advance for what you'll do. We look forward to the return of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray it. Amen.